All right, everybody, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, I see folks are trickling in. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Caroline. I'm uh, with Chalkbeat. For those of you who don't know, we're a, a nonprofit news organization dedicated to writing about education and equity in Tennessee. Also on the line uh, from Chalkbeat with us today is uh, reporter Laura Faith Cabetta and social strategist Susan Gonzalez. Um, as we continue this difficult, crazy se season of learning that we find ourselves in, we at, Chalkbeat, we at Chalkbeat believe that students are the experts on how to improve education during COVID-19, and we want to create spaces where their perspectives can be heard. We're really grateful for the Education Trust in Tennessee for helping create this space. Um, we're actually building off a conversation. We started in May with the same group of students. Um, I'm about to hand it over to Alexa to get us started. Um, but first, a little bit of housekeeping. I see a couple folks saying hey in the chat box. Feel free to introduce yourself. We're also going to throw up a poll here uh, in just a second that asks um, how you identify. Uh, take a second to fill this out. This just gives us uh, a little bit of an idea for who's in the room uh, and I think is fun for our students and fun during this weird time that we find ourselves in to feel a little bit of camaraderie even, a, in, even in a virtual setting. Um, this conversation will be recorded and shared afterward uh, via email for folks who you think should, should hear the conversation but maybe aren't here today. A um, couple other notes, please use the Q&A box for any questions for our students. Uh, we'll have a time at the end for audience questions. Um, all right, well, thanks for those who filled out the poll. We're gonna share those results. I see a bunch of community members, educators, some parents, uh, policymakers, got a student in the house, which is amazing. Um, so thanks for doing that. Uh, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Alexa, Assistant Director for the Education Trust in Tennessee, who's going to kick us off. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, hi, everyone. We're so excited to have you here today. I'm Alexa Barajas-Clark. I'm the Assistant Director for Tennessee at the Education Trust. At the Education Trust, we advocate for the high academic achievement for all students, but especially for students of color and for those living in poverty. We believe that students have a lot of important things to say, and that is um, now true more, more than ever. Uh, it's a critical time to hear directly from students uh, what's working, what's not, uh, but also the recommendations for how school leaders and policymakers can better help them su successfully navigate uh, this year ahead. Uh, in a few moments, uh, you will hear from five high school students from across Tennessee. They are part of our Empower Ed project aimed at helping students use their voice to be advocates for the changes they wish to see in their schools and their communities. Uh, you can learn more about the project and read about these specific students at empoweredtn.org. And in a second, I'll drop that information in the chat. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our student moderator for today's conversation, Ruby Aguilar, a college student who's also a part of our Empower Ed project. Uh, Ruby will be featured in part two of our student roundtable with eight college students from across the state. That conversation will take place next Thursday, September 17th, and we will explore the realities of attending college in Tennessee during a pandemic. Uh, we invite you to register for that event as well, and we'll make sure to include that information uh, in the chalk in the, thank you, Caroline, for dropping that in. Uh, we also encourage you to tweet about the event um, that you're on right now using the hashtags TN Student Voice and Empower Ed, and we'll be sure to keep dropping that in the chat in case you all forget. Uh, and with that, take it away, Ruby. Thank you, Alexa. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ruby Aguilar, and I am a current senior at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am pursuing my degree in English teaching for uh, secondary education, so I'm hoping to become a high school teacher. I want to say thank you to Chalkbeat and the Education Trust for allowing me to co-moderate this event again. And I just want to say that I'm super excited to hear from our panelists and engage in this conversation with you all about an important topic. So to begin, I'd first want the panelists to introduce yourselves. So I want you to tell me your name, the city and school where you're at, your grade, and also one thing that you hope the audience takes away from this conversation today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Caleb. So Caleb, if, if you wanna go ahead and take it away. 
Yes, good evening, everyone. Before I begin, I would like to say thank you to all of our co-sponsors tonight. Chalkbeat, um, the Tennessean, which is a partner of US Today, and most importantly, the Education Trust here in Tennessee. And I'll get on to me. Good evening, everyone. As I said earlier, my name is Caleb Sai. I'm a rising ninth, well, 10th grader now at the East T-STEM Academy right here in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm very elated to be here today. And I hope that what people take from this conversation is actually listening and participating in the chat, um, participating in the Q&A box. And let's get the show on the road and I'll pass it to someone else. Thank you for sharing that, Caleb. Up next, we have Kez. Uh, hi, my name is Kaz Eccles. Right now, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the school I go to is MLK, uh, MLK High School. I am in the ninth grade, and uh, the one thing I would want people to take away from this is that I feel like you should, we should listen to students more. I mean, obviously, since I'm a student, I would probably want that, but if you, like, give them a chance and, like, actually listen to what they're saying, we usually have important things to say. Thank you, Kez. I love that you're advocating for us to listen to students more. Up next, we have Shania. Hi, my name is Shania Mason. I am a senior. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I attend Austin East Magnet High School. And the one thing that I want every panelist on here and attendee to take from this is that every voice matters right now. During this pandemic, during life, in general, every voice matters. All right, thank you, Shania. Up next, we have Farah. Farah, go Hi. ahead. Hi, my name is Uma Farah. I'm, I live in Nashville and I go to Hume Fogg and I'm a senior. And the thing I hope people take away from this is that we're grateful for the changes that have occurred with regards to online schooling. And we're also excited for what's about to come. Thank you, Farah. And last but not least, we have Benjamin. So Benjamin, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I am Benjamin Concha. Uh, my school is uh, East High School from Hamlin County, and I'm a freshman. And what I want you to take away from this is uh, the feeling of the students, like the frustration that some students have uh, in this pandemic. Awesome. Um, well, thanks uh, again, students. We're so excited you're here and so excited to learn from you. Uh, so let's jump in, right? I, I'd love to start. Um, if we think back to when in-person uh, school stopped last semester, I'd love to hear just what that was like for you. Uh, I'd love to start there, um, thinking back on last semester. Uh, what was it like for you and what do you wish your teachers or school had done differently? Um, so I'd love to hear from a lot of us on this. Uh, Kez, why don't we start with you? Uh, when school stopped for me last year, it was very like discombobulating because it's like I we just came to a full stop in our year, like near the end. And that was like really weird. And it, it was very different. And it just, what I don't know, it hit like, because now, because the pandemic really like is the reason that we are you know in this predicament like we are in this quarantine it that it was a shock really and oh, the thing that i wish that teachers had done differently is like maybe in like enforce the online learning a bit better and uh, like actually made an incentive for students to do it yeah thank you um Shania, I'd, I'd love to go to you next. What was it like for you last semester? What do you wish would have been different? Um, last semester when school stopped, it was really a shock, like you said, also, but like, I wish that having technology was more enforced before we got out of school because it was a mid stop in between everything. Like we stopped right before my spring break and then when we heard that we weren't coming back, it was like it canceled everything, like ACTs and college tours. It put everything on a pause for me. So I wish that teachers would just keep inflicting the technology. Yeah, and I'm curious, Shania, when you think about starting this semester so far, have things felt different to you? 
Um, yeah, they're really totally different. And now that like technology is enforced, it's a lot better because we have like a lot more instruction. Like within our school, our teachers have been way more helpful than with they were like kind of like enabled to do before the pandemic because it was like I can't really do anything. I'm not allowed to talk to you outside of an email. But now they're able to talk to us like through Zoom calls and team meetings and everything. Yeah, thanks. And we'll dig into some, some more of that. Um, but thank you, Shania. Um, Farah, how about you? What was last semester like? Uh, what, what do you think about there? Well, I was taking a lot of AP classes, so the exams just weren't like canceled. They were just formatted differently. So a lot of it was doing stuff on my own. So by the end of it, I probably ended up watching like at least 50 hours of the College Board videos that were uploaded on YouTube and like relearning stuff, I guess, because I didn't really like have a direction for what I was supposed to be doing right now. So it's a lot of me just like working harder than smarter, I guess, if that makes sense. And I wish like something they would have done different is like some of the stuff that they're doing right now because that really works. Or at least for me it does because I have like a schedule and I know what I'm supposed to do and when and I really like that. Yeah, and so this semester is off to you for a much better start. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, Caleb, how about you? Yes, thank you, Caroline, for the question. Um, I agree with everyone, with everyone that has said, um, but really one thing that I really think about is really about the need for technology, for equitable technology. Um, I know here in Memphis, you know, it was a lot of debate around, you know, people not having, you know, access to internet access or, you know, computers, laptops, tablets, and I would like to applaud the SCS school board for doing that and giving us, you know, free laptops, free tablets, um, you know, free reliable internet and things of that nature. Um, but I, I really feel as though that teachers really need to see the effectiveness of education because like I've told plenty of people for, if it looks like, if it feels like I've been going on like for months, 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 months at a time, that we've been getting the problem of education wrong for centuries. Before it was funding, incentives, and things of that nature. Now it is lives and people's well-being on how they carry themselves when we progress from you know high school, middle school, elementary school, or what have you. So I feel as though we really need to you know go back and actually see where we messed where we messed up and actually you know go back and really just fix those problems. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. Um, Benjamin, I'll end with you. What was last semester like? Maybe something that's different this semester for you? Uh, well, everything very, uh, well, my mom didn't make me go to the last day of school because she was kind of worried that, it, I mean, the COVID-19 was already out there. Uh, but everything just stopped and uh, all communication also stopped. So I didn't know what was happening or what I had to do. And since, and this year, since we had a, a school, a high school tour, like six months ago, I had no basic layout of the school whatsoever. So it was really hard finding my classes and stuff. So it was kind Benjamin, of- you're, you're back in person as of this week, right? Yes. I am back in uh, person in my high school. All right, as I prepare to become a teacher, it's just great everything that you all are sharing and I appreciate that you're being vulnerable and sharing your thoughts. But our next question, I would like to ask Farah, Shania, and Benjamin. Um, I know that you haven't been in school in a while and then you go back to school or some of you are also online or distance learners, but what do you want your teachers and school leaders to know about your life at home right now? What is one thing that you are just like, I wish they knew this about me, but they don't? So let's start with Farah. Um, one thing I want teachers to know is that life is just as busy as it was pre-COVID or even like more busy because yeah, like just in general, but I also want them to know that we see all the work that like teachers are doing for us, especially with the start of the new semester. Thank you, Farah. Shania, I'd like to hear what is one thing that you just wish that you know, your teachers or leaders in your school knew about your current situation at home or just your life? Okay, um, right now, I wish that teachers would understand, like, in addition to what Farah said, 
that just because we're doing like some people are virtual, some people are in class, you do not have to give a workload of work like each day, like it's not necessary. And then it's still like you have to learn how to balance like your sports life, say if you do have extracurriculars and working and if you're a senior like me and Vera, we have to manage like getting our personal essays together, making sure we have our ACT scores together and college applications all on top of everyday work, everyday life. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I can totally re relate even as a college student, just the workload is much more different. Benjamin, how about you? What would you like your leaders, your school leaders or teachers to understand about your life right now? Um, what I would like uh, for you guys to know is that uh, not everyone's having a tough life. Not everyone's uh, not, because my family hasn't been very much touched by the COVID-19. And so, uh, I mean, we're not having to worry about anybody and we're not having to uh, do anything in that sort of manner. But I mean, uh, I'm having a very good life right now. Uh, not much work. And I have a very uh, easy semester. So, uh, yeah, I just want you guys to know that not everyone's having a, the toughest thing of their, uh, the toughest, like, period of their life right now, and that uh, you don't have to worry about every single person having a bad time. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. I do think it's tough in this environment where uh, things are hard, so much harder in so many ways. Uh, it's encouraging to hear uh, when, when there's uplifting moments and uplifting seasons. And so we're glad to hear that for sure. Um, so not all Tennessee districts have the same approach to what's happening this fall, right? Um, and, and so I'd love to hear from some of you, uh, are you learning from home or going back physically to school? And how do you feel about that choice? Uh, Kez, I'd love to start with you. Uh, right now I'm uh, at home. Right now I'm actually, I'm at my desk that I currently work at it to do all my schoolwork. This is where I have my team's meeting and do all my work on the Schoology webpage. This and is your classroom. We're getting yeah. an inside look. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Uh, it's a very, it, compared to like a regular classroom, it's a very comfy feeling. Maybe that's just the clothes or where I'm at, but it's a comfy feeling being at home. Uh, but I still would rather want to like go out and like experience the uh, high school because I am also a freshman. So high school was gonna be a new experience for me. And now it's like a really new experience for me because I'm in like quarantine. But I understand why we have to stay because you know, viruses are dangerous and it can spread easily. But I just wish that I could, you know, go to school. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks guys. Uh, Caleb, I'd, I'd love to throw this to you. Um, what's what's up this semester? What are you doing? And how do you feel about the choice? Yeah, so like I said earlier, um, SES is going all virtual. Well, it's all virtual, actually. And um, students at East High School and students at district in District 6, because I serve on the Chevy County Youth Council, where I serve in District 6, um, you know, some of them, we don't really, we don't like virtual learning. And I feel as though that we didn't really think about the context of virtual learning because I mean, yes, I mean, yeah, we are protecting students' safety, the public health safety aspect of it, but are we, like, are we putting a blind eye towards the students' future, future education? Like, yes, so yes, like public safety is a great thing, but will graduation rates decrease. School violence may be down, but will juvenile arrests go up? Will, yes, we are providing school lunches, free reduced lunches, but will a student actually get those milks, fruits, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables each and every single night? You know, and I feel as though, you know, we didn't really think about um, a lot of those things when we say all virtual. Um, so it's really about really like, it's really like they get at the catch 22 right there, whether we sacrifice safety over a future well being of education. Um, so, yes, that's just me. Thanks, Caleb. I think that was really well said. Um, Benjamin, I, I'd like to end with you for this. You've got a different experience this semester than a lot of your peers on this call. So tell us what that's been like in your first week back at school. 
Uh, well, I'm going uh, in school. I mean, in person to the high school, and we're required to have masks, or they'll give you one and stuff like that. And you'll have a free lunch, and they're splitting off like into the uh, some stu. I mean, some classes are going back to their classroom to eat lunch, and then some are staying in the cafeteria to have more spreading out. Uh, but I don't know. It's I mean, even though we are in person. A lot of the teachers are saying, if we go to virtual, if we go to virtual, every teacher is saying that. So they are just preparing us and getting us to know these uh, uh, online uh, websites that we are using to learn online. And Benjamin, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, what was the feeling like at school this week? Like, were people kind of on edge? Were they happy to see each other? Like, what, describe to us how it felt this week to be back with your peers. Um, mostly felt happy since we hadn't seen each other in a few months. So not, some people might be on edge, but not, most people were uh, just happy to see uh, their peers and stuff. Yeah, I have seen, I have some students in person right now in my student teaching placement, Benjamin, so I can totally, you know, I, I've seen it in the classroom, what you, all that you've mentioned. But for our next question, um, I'd like to ask uh, some of you, what is one thing your teachers, school, or administrators could do today to better support you? I know many of you are mentioning, you know, there's this added workload, there's this added stress in a way. So what do you think that your school leaders or teachers could do better in terms of supporting you, whether in person or distance learning? So I want to start off with Shania. Um, right now, like my teachers, they're very supportive as far as like the work. Like they understand it is a lot, but right now they're like kind of packing everything on us to implement just in case we do go red. Like so, we'll be prepared to be able to wake up and get started and get everything done, and be like stricter on timelines because I'm still in like AP class and stuff. So most of my AP teachers, they're like, we're just gonna get in here, we're gonna cram it in because we did miss like the rest of school from like March all the way to May and that can like affect us going into like our college. There are some people there that are moving up throughout high school because you're going from middle school straight into what is kind of like a scare. But another thing they could really do is just not just protect our physical health but our mental like check-ins. Shania, just the follow up, follow up question. You said you're a senior and you're in the process of applying to college. So do you feel that you're being supported in that process by your teachers or mentors or even the leaders in your school? Um, not really like teachers, but we kind of have like a support group at our school to where like our counselors and stuff, we have like group meetings and reminds and we can set up like physical, like in-person meetings with just us and the other like college advisor to help us get ready. So they're being really good with that, even though we were kind of like postponed about ACTs and stuff. So it's kind of pushing us back, but they're also informing us on ACT preps, when can we take our ACTs and things of that sort. Yeah, that's great to hear that you're supported in that way as well. Um, Farah, I'd like to hear from you a bit about how could teachers or administrators support you um, or better support you in the situation that we're in right now? For me personally, I feel like one thing that's like lacking online is like connection with other students. So there will be a class of like 20 to 25 kids, but no one will have their camera on except the teacher. So it just feels kind of empty, even though there are kids there. So I feel like just advocate, because I know you can't make students turn on their cameras because of like privacy laws and stuff, but you can like advocate and be like turning cameras on creates like a sense of community while you're at school and it's not like it doesn't feel as remote if people have cameras on yeah it does feel a little weird you know doing building community online and figuring out how to build that community online so thank you for sharing that and the last one i want to hear is from kez what are some ways that your teachers or administrators can better support you um for me i think like flexible like uh, deadlines for certain things like tests and quizzes or like uh, lab reports or notes and things such as that because like we know we don't know what's going to happen maybe one day the internet might knock out because the like because there was a storm the other day 
or maybe our computer is working because we're having computer problems. And it's honestly like, I mean, and some people, you know, I understand that you don't want to do that because some people will just be lazy. But I feel like for people who like actually get in those accidents, it's very important to like be a little flexible with them and like have a talk so you can know which people actually need that extension on their deadlines and things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Kaz. So we've gotten quite a few questions from the audience about uh, what's next after high school. Um, and I know we have some seniors here with us today. Um, and Farah, I, I'd love to ask this to you. Uh, and Shania, I know you touched on this in the last question, so I'll, I'll circle back. But starting with Farah, um, when you're thinking about what comes after high school, how has COVID-19 affected your college application process or how you're thinking through what's next? Um, and do you feel like you have different needs this year uh, and when it comes to thinking through what's next and how are those needs being met or not met? COVID has definitely added another dynamic, I guess, to my college situation because my mom's kind of using it as an excuse to try to get me to stay close to Nashville, which she knows isn't going to happen and I know isn't going to happen, but it's just like another thing. And also getting a test date has been like really difficult. So I had my ACT scheduled, well, one from the school and then that got canceled. And then I had one in the middle of the summer and then that ended up getting canceled too. So I had to stay on the phone with ACT for like four and a half hours. And I actually ended up getting a date, but I don't know if that date is, like if I'm gonna get the score back in time for certain scholarships, cause some scholarships are, cause even though a lot of schools have gone test optional, you know, they're not really test optional. Like they're just saying that, especially with like the Ivies and all of that, how test optional are they gonna be if you like know what I mean? So yeah, it's just been really difficult, especially like the most stressful thing is getting a test score. So I've just been really trying to like get on that and hoping it comes back in time. Yeah, that, it really pains me to hear that, Farah, because it's so stressful anyway. And um, like you said, it just adds another layer. Um, Shania, I'm curious if you have anything else to add about uh, kind of what extra supports you feel like you need this year when you think about what's next after high school and how those are being met or not. Okay, so um, like Farah said, when she was talking about like how ACT is like postponed and keeps getting pushed back or rescheduled and stuff like that, and how she was saying like colleges, some of them are waiving the ACT, but really ACT is what gets you like your scholarships. So that's what can give you that full ride that you might have been trying to get. And it's missing like with early action deadlines because those are like November 1st. Some ACTs are not to like October 22nd, and you won't get your test date back to like a week later, and then you'll miss that and have to start all the way over. So really, it's just teaching me to be more flexible with understanding. Like, yes, we we get that you have to enforce college, but it is kind of hard to balance applying to everywhere when you're missing that one chunk that is everything really. Yeah, I remember applying to colleges in high school and I cannot imagine just that added stress and even that added anxiety of getting those applications in and meeting all the, you know, the extra requirements and the, uh, you know, the changes that they've made. So I'm curious to hear, and Shania and uh, Farah kind of touched on this, but as far as like mental health and just how the social connection that you have with your peers, um, how can school support student mental mental health and provide a social connection in a remote learning environment? And I know Farah kind of brought this up of the lack of community, but I want to hear from Kez. What do you think about how schools can support student mental health, but also improve social connection with students? Um, first, on the mental health, like how schools can support student mental health, I feel like definitely because guidance counselors are always in the background like you have their information you have their emails you know where to contact them but you never really get that push like people that need it really don't get that push to go because they don't feel like they can actually help so i feel like if guidance counselors like step up like step out up and out more i feel like the kids that will need like them need their mental health 
checked by like the guidance counselor, they'll like actually give it a thought because it's not just in the background, it's now you can see them and you know like that can actually help you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Kez. Um, I also wanna hear from Caleb. What do you think about how schools can support student mental health and then the social connection in a remote learning environment? Yes, thank you for the question, Ruby. Um, how schools can, it, it was basically piggybacking off of what Kaz said, you know, actually having the guidance counselors or actually having, you know, behavioral specialists or people or like psychologists, you know, come into schools, um, if you're like um, in person, you know, coming in, you know, actually, you know, seeing what that student is actually like feeling like and like, and even for teachers, you know, saying like, hey, I'm just going to use me as an example. Hey, Mr. Sai, you know, how are you doing? You know, how's everything going on at home? That it's the little things that count really in during, during times like this, because I mean, we've experienced a lot over the past five months. I know for in SES, we've been out, we've experienced George Floyd, Jacob Blake, Rashard Brooks, all of those um, people, Breonna Taylor, we've experienced COVID, we've experienced everything, probably some family members have died, um, school classmates, teachers, administrators have probably all died in our lives. So it's really about having to really think about the other side and having empathy, the key word, empathy for others, and actually putting yourself in those people's shoes. Yeah, I agree, Caleb. Empathy, it is huge, you know, understanding, putting yourself in others' shoes. Shania, I would like to end with you and just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you think you could be better supported with your mental health or other students and then with that social connection in a remote learning environment as well, how can that be improved? Okay, um, I think that since like since going back to school instead of like doing virtual, it's been more about like physical health, like social distancing, mask, wipe everything down when you come into class. It's more about that instead of like your mental, because like I am a senior, so everything's like stressful on top of that. But I know it's like freshmen who are like wow, man, like, I'm really in here. I don't know any of these people. Most of my classmates are at home because they enforce that more with freshmen. I don't know why, really. And then on top of that, it's been, I think that maybe if people were okay with, like, the fact that if you don't feel, like, 100% one day, you could reach out to somebody. Like, it's people who are willing to help you, but it's more so they would rather talk to, like, people that are closer to in age than adults. So I feel like you can connect to anybody instead of like a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So. Yeah, thank you, Shania. Um, so the next question that I want to go to was actually a topic that was touched a lot, uh, touched on a lot when we asked you, you all, audience members, to pre-submit questions. Um, and I've seen it brought up a couple times here today live. I, I want to zoom us out to a different topic um, briefly. So the summer has been a pivotal moment in time. Uh, there are a lot of conversations happening about racial injustice, police brutality, um, activism generally, that's at the forefront of our minds. Um, and there's a lot of dialogue about anti-racism and how to be anti-racist. And so I'd love to hear from a couple of you, what does anti-racist action look like to you, especially when you think about how school leaders and teachers can be anti-racist? Um, Farah, I'd love to start with you with this question. For this question specifically, I think it's important to know what the situation is. So you can't, so you can't do a lot of what's called performative activism, where you just see what your friends are posting and you'll repost it just for, I guess, I don't think clout is the right word, but basically. So I think it's important to have like a literature base on whatever you're researching. And I personally would recommend um, Professor George Yancey, at, he's a professor at Emory and he's the philosophy professor. And he gives a lot of lectures on the idea of whiteness, um, the white people's gaze and stuff like that. And I got to listen to him while I was at debate camp and it was a really eye-opening lecture for me. And I don't think it's enough for you to just like go in and sit in and hear the lecture. I think you actually have to like listen to what he's saying and apply that to your life. Because even while I was at the lecture, a lot of people were making like rude comments towards the professor and it was like they weren't taking in anything of what he was saying. So I think it's important to start with yourself and assess yourself and be like, 
I need to work on X, Y, and Z, and then actually do something to work on X, Y, and Z. Yeah, thank you, Farah. And I'd love for you to stick the name in the chat and send it to everyone. Um, educators, especially, I'd love for you to take note of that. I think it's a really great and practical suggestion. Um, Caleb, I'd love to go to you with this question. Yes, thank you, Caroline. Um, I feel as though that racists and teachers should not be in the same sentence. I feel as though if you are a teacher, and I'm going to, you know, tell it to you, you know, 100, as people say, or keep it, you know, straight up. I feel as though if you are a teacher and you have a certain bias against someone, whether that be their skin color, their religion, this, that, and the third, then you, quite frankly, probably don't really need to be a teacher after all. Um, I feel as though that, you know, when we really think about education and we really think about the power of education, it takes everyone being included in this thing. Because I mean, like for like a fun, like a um, skinny man with a funny last name should also be included. You know, with um, a Muslim woman who has a hijab on, she should feel included. A the, a boy who wants to go grow up to, you know, be a woman or have you know lipstick on or wear a dress to school. That is his choice, and I feel as though they those students should not be judged on that but back to the question how to be anti-racist um it's really about having empathy and i would like to quote michelle obama for what she said times like this does not show who you are it reveals who you are it reveals your ethics it reveals your morals it reveals reveals your character most importantly your character how do you stand how do you have the thing called empathy that i talked about earlier how do you have the thing about empathy and actually showing that and not just you know just saying that, oh, I feel sorry for you, but actually showing it through your actions. Because I come from a place where actions surely do speak louder than words. Great, thank you, Caleb. Um, Caleb, I do have a follow-up question for you in the chat from Robin, uh, who says that they agree, um, but they wanna know, do you find that teachers can learn to leave racist tendencies if they have them? Thank you for the question, Robin. Um, and like I've, you know, told people for, um, for months now at a time, you cannot change what you have been taught at home. You cannot change what your parents have instilled in you from day one. But it's actually, like I said, having empathy, actually seeing like, hmm, okay, I'm white or I'm Caucasian. Let me say Caucasian. I'm Caucasian, but how does it feel when a black man is in America. How does it feel when he has to walk outside every day? How does it feel to him when it, when things just like triggers him to think certain ways about certain things? So it's not, so I'm not saying that, hey, you know, just because, you know, you read a few books, you're going to know, you know, 100% how it feels to be black. But what I'm saying is, is that not really, not really recognizing your privilege, but really, you know, recognizing your privilege and seeing your place in America and really showing that and actually saying that, hey, I understand your hurt. I understand your pain, your generations and centuries of sorrow, pain, and anger. I understand. How can me and you work together to solve the problem? How can me and you, how can we come together to solve the problem? And that's why I feel as though that's what we need. We need integration more than separation. So yes, if that answers your question, Robin. Thank you, Caleb, and also thank you, Farah, for sharing that. Um, I think it's just great all that you're saying here. I feel very empowered by it. Um, but my next question here is just a general question for everyone. I know when we spoke back in May, a lot of you shared like there was a lot of uncertainty about what was gonna happen. There was like a lack of communication. So I'm just curious to hear how are, how is your schools communicating with you right now? And what do you need from them that you're not getting? So since it's just a general question, I wanna start off with Kez. You wanna go ahead and take it away, Kez. Um, yeah, I would love to. Right now, the main way uh, students and teachers communicate is either through email or my school personally has this thing called office hours. And I think it's actually some a great thing that uh, a lot of schools should implement if they like have the time in their schedules too, is basically office hours is like an hour where 
all the teachers are in their own little teams meeting where they can uh, set up a room and have students come in and ask questions. And I feel like that's really helpful because, you know, the work they give us is like, is sometimes complicated. So they need help in asking like questions from the teachers. And I feel like if you don't have that avenue like easily accessible, you can easily fall behind and or not do as well. So, uh, right. I don't think right now anything, for, I don't need anything from the teachers because I think they've actually been doing a pretty good job. Yeah, thank you, Kez. Uh, what about you, Farah? What do you think about how your school is communicating with you and what do you need from them that they might not be giving you? So I'm in the same school district as Kez, so a lot of it has also been the same like office hours and email, but our, most of our teachers also opened up Google voice numbers so we can just text them. Like if we're shy and we don't want to like show people that we have questions in class, we can privately text them and they won't like say who the question was from, but they'll just bring it up to everyone and then they'll answer it that way. And I don't think my school really needs to change anything right now because they have been listening a lot to our grade and our school in general because we didn't like the current schedule. So students at our school advocated to have a meeting with administration and they actually ended up changing our entire schedule to what we wanted. And we really appreciated the fact that they listened to us with that. Yeah, it's really great, you know, when they take your voice and, you know, take action. Um, lastly, I would like to hear from Benjamin. Um, how has your school been communicating with you? And is there something that you wish they would be doing differently that they're not doing right now? Uh, well, uh, middle school, my middle school, they didn't really tell me a lot of information of what to do. Uh, they didn't really tell me anything really. Uh, but high school, they've, uh, they've set up a remind and like, a uh, Google Classroom, which we, we can email and talk to them through the text and stuff like that. Uh, so we're having, I can ask the teacher anything I want. Uh, so, and I mean, communication is not the problem right now. And uh, our teachers are actually doing a very good job at, you know, communicating with the students and really teaching them how to do everything online. Thanks, Benjamin. Uh, and I, I just want to follow up quickly. Uh, Margaret asked, uh, asked in the chat, uh, Kez and Farah, can you briefly describe what schools you go to? Are they neighborhood schools or magnet or charter? Or just tell us quickly what schools you go to because she says that it sounds awesome what they're up to. I go uh, to a magnet school and Kez goes to a magnet school as well and we're in the same district. Yeah. I got a MLK. Uh, it's in the middle of Nashville, so it, it's also a magnet school. Great. Thanks, y'all. Um, I'm going to ask another question that we got submitted before we started today, and then we're going to move to audience questions. Um, I'm just going to ask this to Shania and Caleb. Um, what's a silver lining for you in all of this, and what's giving you hope right now? Shania, I'd love to start with you. Um, really like the silver lining and the thing that's giving me hope right now is knowing that like my teachers, well, one of my teachers, I know we're not really supposed to like disclose your names, but my math teacher, she's preparing me for if we do have to go all red. She's preparing me for college. She's enforcing like everything that she learned through her college experience and also what we're going to have to implement just in case the pandemic doesn't really end before we go into that transition from childhood into adulthood. So really the only thing keeping me hope is just knowing that how everything is pack loaded now, if I get used to it now, I'll be okay later. Yeah, thank you. Caleb, how about you? Yes, thank you, Caroline, for the question again. Um, I feel as though the silver lining for me will have to be teachers. Um, my teachers are very awesome. Um, at East High School um, from my first period all the way down to my eighth period. Very, very special, very special, you know, checking up on me and my family, making sure that we are okay. And and really about like what's really like the silver lining and really like hope is really that on the, on the bigger aspect for me is really that one day we will be done with COVID-19, you know, and like I've told people, unfortunately, it will have to get worse before it can get better. And 
as long as we can just keep our uh, eye on the prize that one day we will get through this and that we need to stop having our own political beliefs and actually come together, like I said, integration instead of separation. And if we just actually come together and actually say that one day we will get through this, let's put our political beliefs to the side and let's actually work this thing out to find a vaccine or what have you, then maybe we will get back to school safely and sound like we did way before um, this pandemic this pandemic even arrived on our shores. Thank you for sharing that, Caleb. So right now we're going to jump into some questions from the audience. And we actually have one that was pre-submitted from a school board member. And they want to know, what can school board members do to make the learning experience better for students learning online? So I'm curious to hear from you, Farah. Um, for me, I think school board members could have surveys or something to see how we like the current system because I think feedback is always necessary when you want to make change so don't like just change it up on us without knowing if we like it or if we like don't like it and I think that would be important in assessing where like all of us are with the system that they have in place. Yeah thank you. Um, Kez what about you what do you think school board members could be doing you know, to make um, learning experience better. I feel like it's like basically kind of what Farah said, just like opening your doors to students and probably more like teachers as well, because teachers listen, some, a lot of teachers listen to their students and the teachers could like reach up, reach out to the, uh, to the school board members to like tell you what, tell you what the students are saying. And I feel like maybe if you have like an email or something, I mean, or like a email only accessible to the teachers. So like if kids really want something, they could email their teachers about it and then the teachers can email the school board and they can maybe like take that into the group, like the whole group school board thing and like make a change about it if they agree with it. Thank you, Kez. Um, we also have a question from Dahlia, who I believe is also a, a Shelby County Schools student and actually helped Chalkbeat moderate a different event. So Dahlia, we're glad you're here. Um, how, are you, how are you virtual learners dealing with connectivity issues? Um, so Shania, I'd like to start with you. Okay, um, technically I'm really not virtual because I go to school, but like for the part that I am virtual in some classes, our teachers are already implementing. They're just going to start teaching through like Teams and Zoom and stuff like that. So the virtual, it's kind of okay, but it is a lot of like day-by-day -day technical difficulties that we do like come against. Like sometimes it'll lag or sometimes computers will just randomly update and then it will like count you technically absent for your class because through that team meeting, that's how they check you in for present tardy absent. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, Caleb, how about you? You're fully online, so what have connectivity issues looked like for you? Connectivity issues. Um, I would like to first thank, um, I believe it was Dahlia. I believe she's on the MICA Youth Council. Um, she participated in the school um, board debate, and congratulations on that. You did very awesome in that. Um, but back to the question, um, connectivity issues here in Shelby County and for Shelby County um, school students um, from what I'm hearing is somewhat terrible because I mean like I know like um, Caroline and especially here in Memphis we had like a graph which actually showed that you know this side of the city um, was like suffering from internet connectivity issues and this side was pretty okay and this side was you know right on the mark it was able to get you know, the high speed internet that it needed right then and there. And, you know, the internet connectivity issues here in Memphis, it is very, very, very bad um, for the majority of students in low income communities. Um, so it'll really have to be about really like, like I said, like coming together and actually, you know, solving the problem of the digital divide. I know that was a big thing that Chalkbeat did was um, the digital divide. So it'll really have to be about really solving the digital divide and making sure everyone is equitably represented at the um, at the school board level so yes yeah thank you all for sharing that so our next question is from Janelle in the audience Janelle wants to know how do you feel your school can help you best prepare for the next step after high school 
For example, how can they help you best prepare for the workforce, college, military, knowing that they won't necessarily be able to attend college fairs? So Benjamin, I know that you're a freshman and I know that you're in, you know, a beginner in high school, but how do you think that your school could help you prepare for what's to come after high school? Uh, just teach you what, uh, what you're going to do, like maybe math classes could teach taxes or see, show them what a tax form would look or just anything that would be like actually useful in life because sometimes we're not going to use the Pythagorean theorem in life, right? So just try to, I mean, because we have the JROTC, which is like the junior air force basically, which uh, could, uh, I mean, help students uh, get prepared for the military and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, we don't really know much about what to do in adulthood or adulthood. Like, we don't know how to take off care of all of our responsibilities and stuff, like our money and stuff like that. Just try to teach people or students really uh, how to become an adult. Yeah. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, I agree. The Pythagorean theorem, you know, I haven't used it to this day. Kez, what about you? How do you think that your school could um, help you best prepare for what's to come after high school? I mean, yeah. Uh, being taught things that you're not necessarily going to use all the time is like not helping. But I feel like just being told like what you're going to do because what you're doing, what you're going to do in high school, like what they kind of things like picking your major or minor, because that the thing, those things like that, I haven't really learned from the school. I've learned from my parents because they went to college. And I think like most kids in school right now and in high school, like it, are going to exp aspire to go to college. So I feel like like getting that information like about college, what happens in college, like how to pro like I know that in us uh, that seniors like get this but like maybe like telling us how to apply for colleges like a little earlier so we can like try to like, create like rough drafts of our of things like that and you know just just information earlier i guess thanks kez all right well we have time for one more question um and i'd love for everyone here uh to weigh in if we have time um what's what it's from kim what is one thing you would suggest to parents and caregivers to help their students have success during the school year? So we've been talking a lot about school and teachers and administrators. Let's talk about parents really quick. Uh, what's one thing that you'd suggest for them? Um, Farah, I'd love to start with you. I would just suggest to like check up on your child because my mom does that a lot and it helps me stay on my like agenda. She'll be like, did you take a test even if she doesn't know if I have a test or not but if I did have one I'll remember that I have one so yeah that's great um Shania how about you um my mom really she texts in on me a lot too and like in general even if it's just like a simple text message like how's your day going is it hard today like what can I help you with stuff like that because she knows like the stress of it all can get to you but I think parents should just be more like one-on-one -on -one with their kid like even after a long day like even if it's just like a quick connection at dinner or something like that it could just be a simple one thing that could just help them improve the rest of it yeah I love that um Benjamin how about you for this question uh well during summer my mom really uh, started making me study a little bit more math and stuff like that and language arts and history to get me kind of prepared for high school, uh, which helped me a, a lot to get kind of in the rhythm of stuff. So just try to really force your kids to study and just check out, check up, uh, check up all of, to see if they're doing their work and stuff and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, Kez, I'll go to you next. Um, it, it sounds nice to have your, uh, like, I mean, to have your parents come and check up on you, but like sometimes I feel like my mom, because she loves me a lot and I know that. And a lot of the things she does is out of love for me, 
but like sometimes I wish she would just like step back because I'm trying to learn how to do this thing on my own and I'm I know I'm gonna mess up like from time to time and like on those occasions I would want my mom to step in but sometimes like she needs to you know step back so I can like try to figure this thing out on my own because eventually I'm going to have to figure out my entire rest of my life on my own so your, your mom will always be there you know um but yeah that's great I think that's really good cuz all right Caleb how about you um I, re I feel as though that you know with parents you know and with my mom and my father you know they sat me down at the kitchen table you know, made sure, you know, I had my homework, made sure I knew my ABCs, my one, two, threes, all that jazz. You know, they made sure that my, that they connected me to my education and I connected to my education. So I feel as though parents should take pride in their students' education. Yes, I provide food on the table and all of that jazz, but I am your parent. I am supposed to help you. I am going to make sure that you succeed in life. And um, especially as, you know, as a black, you know, child in America, you know, you don't really like get, you know, a lot of, of that support, you know, really from school. So some of that, some of those, you know, support systems have to happen, you know, at, at the house, you know, at home. So I feel as though, you know, having that support system and having the parents actually take pride in their students' education is going to be a vital thing in, in times like this. That's awesome, Caleb. Thank you. Um, so before I wrap up, Ruby, I actually want to ask you a question. We just got it in late um, from Jonathan. I think it's a really important question. And I want to ask it to you both as a college student, a former K-12 student, and an aspiring teacher. So Jonathan asked, how can we empower student voice, especially for students whose demographics we don't normally hear from, students with exceptional needs, foster youth minorities, English language learners, and Jonathan says that he himself is an autistic student. Uh, so how can we empower student voice, especially for students um, from demographics we don't normally hear from when it comes to decisions that affect us right now, both academically, social, emotionally, uh, during this pandemic and in the future? So Ruby, not to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot. Um, as you were reading that question, the first thing that came to mind was just providing a safe space for students to you know, express themselves and really voice their opinions because I feel a lot of times you know we have all these adults making the decisions and that's really what this is all about that adults are making this the decision but is anyone really listening to what students need so positioning myself as a student right now and not as a teacher that I will be soon um, really you know focusing on prioritizing what spaces are we creating for these students to have a voice spaces like the one we're in today like this is a great conversation and a space for them to say you know, this is what I feel like should be changing. Um, and then like providing that, I am a huge advocate for social emotional learning and mental health. Um, so what supports and resources are we providing for students? It's not just in school, but outside of school. And culturally speaking, for those students whose families probably don't know about mental health, how are we bringing awareness to them? And how are we, you know, educating them and letting them know that there's resources and it's okay to access those resources? Um, so those are just the two, the two things that came to mind right now. And then just thinking back of me growing up as a student, um, just schools being more purposeful about hiring um, support staff and teachers who look like the minority, you know, the minoritized communities in their schools. That's the whole reason why I want to become a teacher, because growing up, I did not have any Latina teachers. I probably had two black teachers and I saw that and I said, there's a need in my community. So that's just, you know, that's just my spill here of how schools can improve. Thank you, Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, that was amazing. And a great note to end on, uh, cause we're at time. So I just wanna say thank you to our amazing student panelists. Folks, before you pop off and enjoy your evenings, um, please throw these students some love in the chat uh, and let them, read your thoughts because uh, they gave us a lot of their time after long school days and I think that's just incredible. I want to thank uh, the Education Trust in Tennessee who made this event possible and are working with these students in really cool ways. Um, also the Tennessean who helped us amplify this event and joined us as a, as a media partner. A couple of things before we end our time. Exactly one week to, from today we're going to 
do this conversation again with college students. Ruby won't be a co-moderator. She'll be on that panel and as you just heard, has really amazing things to say. Uh, I'd appreciate it if one of my EdTrust uh, friends would stick the link to that in the chat. Um, please RSVP if you haven't yet so you can join just like you joined today. Hopefully uh, when you leave, when you exit out of the Zoom, a little pop-up survey will come on. Uh, please take two minutes to fill that out. It really, really helps us as we try to do more of these events and make them better and more interesting and more helpful to folks. Um, so thank you again, students, Kez, Farah, Shania, Benjamin, Caleb, and Ruby. Uh, Y'all are fantastic and we're so um, benefited by your perspective. Uh, so we hope to see you all again next week and thank you so much for joining.